uh, I have introduced you to this website called prepared foods and another one is um, food product design still remember no huh? <laughs> that's an honest uh, mission both this uh, both website uh, you can find the lot of useful articles related to what we are uh, studying now what we are learning now on starch and also another topic on fat and oil but in addition of course on other things that we learn in the whole curriculum of food science so you can see for example here um, you can see you can find articles re re related to uh, so in, it is group on uh, is group based on the application in different type of food yeah and it's also uh, group based on the type of ingredients so on starch we have down here uh, where is starch ah here gum and starches so if you have time maybe you want to explore here but um, I will maybe pick one or two articles from this group to share with you and uh, I hope you can find time to read and make your own notes here yeah? very useful on prepared food also there's plenty of information you can find on different groups of ingredients the one that you might be interested maybe again on gum and starches but the other one later maybe on emulsifiers fat and oil and the, the article written uh, on this website are uh, very practical uh, using a very practical approach using a real life industry uh, case studies so you can learn how the ingredients are being used in actual application what are the problems and issues uh, usually uh, encountered by the industry when they use these uh, ingredients and how do they address the problems address the issue overcome the problems um, and my favorite is this technical solution and presentation here so you can find on say any topic come in starches a list of presentation this is a recorded uh, a recorded presentation given by the industry specialist they will talk about the you know in this case what modified starch and they will share with the audience the real uh, case studies and how they use this modified starch in this case to uh, solve certain problems to improve the product so the information sometimes uh, you cannot find in any textbook or other or in any uh, website so feel free to explore these two websites when you have time and maybe uh, when you after you have graduated if you end up working in the food industry and you need to find solution for some problems you know where to find at least uh, the, re the resources that you can use we are still on starch so the test would cover starch basically um, including the application until the last part of this topic but today maybe I, I, I would not have time to complete I mean to discuss the application but I would assume that you can explore, you can read on your own, basically a lot of reading and maybe find some of the online presentation there to, to, to supplement and to complement what uh, we cover in the lecture. Okay? If you listen to those presentations, it's actually better than you listen from me because they are the experts and they actually use a real case uh, study that, uh, that show the real application of starch, modified starch and so on. So today we just uh, look at starch modification. First we have to understand 
why do we need to modify something that is natural? Yeah, Shen? You like something that is natural, right? So do we, do we need to, to modify something that is natural? Do we need to do something with natural beauty, for example? <laughs> so natural is always good. Do you agree? Something that is natural is always good. Always. Not necessarily, right? Uh, not necessarily. So sometimes there are uh, shortcomings and limitations of the natural thing. In this case, we are talking about starch, of course. So natural starch, uh, usually we use the term native. Native starch. This is the original starch before any modification. For, for domestic home cooking, no problem. We can use the normal uh, native starch. But when we use starch now for large, big-scale industrial production, like to produce bread, to produce all those uh, starch-based uh, products, where we use the big machine, the machinery, the process is very fast, the speed of the production is very fast. We use very high temperature. For example, when, you, when we use starch in product like soup, in canned products, we have to use very high temperature in the retort. So this is where now the native starch has limitation because it cannot withstand those industrial processes. High temperature, long cooking time, high shear mixing process. So we use starch to get the functionality of starch, right? We want to use a starch to get the viscosity, to give the mouthfeel, to get the gelling, gelation, to get the gelling property, to, pro, to, to, to form structure, and therefore give uh, uh, certain textural properties to the product. But then, if the starch cannot retain those, prop, those functionalities, for example, you want to achieve this viscosity, but after you retort the product, you don't get that viscosity because uh, the viscosity, uh, because the starch has maybe broken down, um, then you get very low viscosity instead of high viscosity. So this is where we want to modify the starch. So we have now first understand the reasons for modifying starch. Because starch is exposed to a range of, a wide range of uh, physical processes, temperature, shear rate, and the time, and the pressure. So we can see here on the left, on the left here, this is what we call the unit operation. That's what you learn in unit operation IEK, right? So we have stirring, mixing, there is one unit operation. Dispersing, homogenizing, emulsifying, cracking, forming, pumping, handling, pasteurizing, and so on. And look at the range of temperature. It can range from room temperature or close to room temperature as high as 350 degree Celsius. It's very, very high. Shear rate, if you still remember, the unit of shear rate, reciprocal second, as low as one, as high as 150 thousand in homogenizing and dispersing. If we use high speed homogenizer, high shear homogenizer. So the so in this case we have reasons for modifying starch so that it can withstand this kind of uh, shear rate and also the shear time. And the pressure can be as high as one thousand bar. That is very very high. So obviously, the, in food processing, um, we have ex food is exposed and starch is exposed to different kind of uh, extreme processing condition. So the, the, the question is, why native starch is not, uh, not really suitable? for direct use in food processing. So in this graph, um, we have a comparison. So we have a flow, flow we have a pasting curve here. The bra in this case, we use bra bender instead of RVA, and uh, we have time 
on the x axis this is the temperature profile the dashed line so we have one two three four different type of starch so native starch have a narrow peak viscosity range okay for example this one but it has poor processing tolerance temperature shear and so on it can uh, it has low shear stability the granule uh, during swelling when it has reached a maximum swelling become fragile so it can uh, be uh, ruptured quite easily and become strongly degraded under sterilization condition the amylose amylopectin um, especially in uh, low pH so combination of acidic condition and high temperature would uh, degrade depolymerize break down the polymer under sterilization condition so sterilization always a very high temperature in order to achieve uh, you know the optimum processing to achieve the commercial sterility yeah? cook starch for example waxy maize produce weak bodied cohesive and rubbery paste this characteristic of cook starch weak bodied cohesive and rubbery these are considered uh, poor or undesirable uh, properties what we want to uh, produce is the opposite of this strong bodied less cohesive and you know kind of uh, uh, smooth uh, board, uh, piece yeah oops so in order to uh, overcome this uh, limitation and um, shortcomings we need to do some kind of modification so one type of modification that can be used is cross-linking uh, which is a chemical modification so here we need to use chemicals to modify the starch so cross-linking uh, cross-link starch is a necessary precondition for a shear stability cross linkage improve sterilization stability so by you, later we, we will look at uh, in more detail how we can the, the type of chemical how we can carry out a cross linking reaction to cross link the starch cross link mean the amylose and amylopectin imagine this molecule in the in the granule would be uh, would, would be cross link with each other there's an additional covalent bond that can hold the amylose and amylopectin to make it more stronger uh, and form um, a stronger network so a stronger network means cross link starch is um, more or less similar to a high amylose starch in terms of the characteristic because uh, cross link starch the granule is stronger um, and the tendency to swell is less than the, than the non cross link starch the reason because we have an additional cross link bond yeah, to hold the molecules we will come to that uh, later so when we modify the starch oops, when we modify the starch this is uh, perhaps uh, the native starch when we mo modify using different type of modification it will change the pasting profile so this graph just show the different type of cross linking and how the modification change the original pasting profile of the starch so let's see uh, more detail reasons for modifying starch to modify cooking characteristic to improve tolerance to rigorous processing condition this main reason yeah to improve the tolerance so that uh, the starch can maintain and retain its functional property under different uh, you know under extreme cooking condition extreme temperature extreme shear long time low 
low, uh, low pH to decrease retrogradation. And this is the situation when if we don't want retrogradation. But remember I mentioned earlier, sometimes we do want retrogradation. But if we do not want retrogradation, in this case we want to decrease, then uh, we can also modify. To increase free store stability of paste. Because when starch retrograde, a freeze, a freeze store mean for frozen food, we put uh, in the freezer, uh, freezing, freezing temperature, then we take it out, let it thaw, put it back again, so it can have a few cycles. Yeah? But why, why would you want to freeze, uh, freeze the food, then thaw it again and freeze it again and thaw it? Why, why do you want to do that? This is called freeze thaw. Why, why do we want to do this free store, free store? What is the situation when this free store can... Uh, uh, what is the situation where the food product would be would undergo this cycle of free store? Huh? Uh -huh. Sometimes, in, well, in the house, we put in the freezer, right? We keep in the freezer, then we take it out uh, for, to prepare for frying and so on. So during that time, uh, uh, it will thaw. Then after that, we put back. Okay, that's uh, the domestic situation. Uh, industry? Uh, during the distribution, right? So during the distribution, especially, I think, uh, in Malaysia, uh, the control, the, the, the temperature control is not uh, um, done properly. Yeah? So from the factory, from the warehouse, load to the transport, lorry or whatever, then uh, if it's a frozen food, the, the transport that we use should also be you know, a properly uh, you know, a refrigerated or freezing under freezing condition, but sometimes maybe that it's not well maintained, then you get the temperature, just like our fridge at home. If you're not well maintained, the, the temperature in, in the fridge part, in the, what, the, the, the down part should be what, around maybe five to eight degrees Celsius, but sometimes it can go up to 12 degrees. Uh, so that's the situation also. Then you, the, the, the product will, will uh, thaw, then after that, in the supermarket, they put back in the freezer, they will freeze again. So this is freeze thaw cycle. And for frozen food containing starch, when you have this uh, freeze thaw, freeze thaw situation, it will actually accelerate the process of retrogradation. Accelerate the process of retrogradation. When retrogradation happens, what is the consequence? We get, we get Cyanuresis. We get cyanuresis um, and other deteriorative effect. The cyanuresis, the water would separate out. So these are undesirable. So to, to, to avoid this or to overcome this problem, we, we can um, increase the free store stability again by using modified starch that is resistant to free store. Okay. To decrease paste and gel synalysis, this is the consequence of retrogradation and free store. To improve paste on gel clarity and sheen. In some application, you want to use starch that has a clear paste. Yeah. For example, waxy mess, uh, waxy starch usually would give a clear paste, but if you use, say, cornstarch, maybe it will not give you a clear paste. So it depends on um, the application or the product. If you want a clear paste or in gel clarity, then modification can do this. When starch retrograde, most starch, when they retrograde, the, the, the opacity of the gel would increase you know, from, uh, from clear to opaque. And if that is undesirable in the product, then we have to use starch, modified starch that would give a clear 
uh, paste. To improve film formation, if we use starch as a coating uh, in, in uh, frying application for you know, uh, batters and breading, so we can also use uh, uh, modified starch to improve adhesion, especially in fried food. So these are some, uh, oh, other lagi, to add hydrophobic groups. Uh. Starch, naturally starch is hydrophilic, but we can make it hydrophobic by adding hydrophobic group to the starch because the OH group, the hydroxyl group in starch is uh, easy to be uh, modified through a chemical reaction. So we can attach a hydrophobic group. It can be a, a hydrocarbon chain. It can be a, a functional group that is uh, hydrophobic. So when, when we attach a hydrophobic group and still we have hydrophilic group, then the starch now become can can be used as uh, uh, emulsifying agent can form a stable emulsion as well as a stabilizer. So this is actually two in one. We have we use starch as a stabilizer. We use this this type of starch modified starch as stabilizer and as, and also as uh, emulsifier. Yeah. In fact, in the industry, um, they use this starch to replace uh, Arabic gum. Yeah, because Arabic gum is more expensive and the supply of Arabic gum sometimes not consistent and sometimes the quality of gum Arabic not, uh, I mean, uh, the quality change or not consistent from batch to batch. Yeah? The main exporter of a gum Arabic is Sudan. But Sudan sometimes have, you know, like... Uh, uh, problem like long drought kemarau eh, and, and so on so they cannot supply the gum arabic so now the industry is also using this one but if you read the news uh, and the trend recently in the past few years uh, the industry is actually changing back from using this type of uh, hydrophobic starch in, in their products back to using arabic gum arabic yeah do you, do, do you know why at one time, most industries use gum, gum arabic if they want to have the emulsifying property in beverage emulsion and so on, in confectionery. Then, because of the problem of supply, because the main the main exporter Sudan have a lot of problem, drought, they have war, and, and so on. So, the supply of gum arabic at one time is almost uh, stopped. So, at that time, they were looking for a uh, substitute for gum arabic. So National Starch came up with a pattern and produced this type of starch. And they found it quite, effi quite good, quite efficient to replace uh, gum arabic. But now, it looks like they go back to using gum arabic again. Do you know why? Can you guess? Because of the consumer pressure. The consumer pressure now, um, the consumer, especially in Western countries, Europe, US, and so on, they are become more and more conscious about uh, additive. They want additive-free food or reduced additive. So the manufacturer respond to that because if they don't respond to the consumer demand, then it will affect their, uh, you know, their market. So now, and this is considered additive. Polyphyte starch is considered additive or uh, not natural. Consumer around the world now, maybe Malaysia not so hebat lagi, but uh, in other countries, Western especially, they want additive free. They want natural food, organic, organic, organic. Yeah? Uh, uh, which is okay. <laughs> Cuma, uh, so the manufacturers have the manufacturers have to respond. So they that's why now they revert back to using gum arabic although it's more expensive yeah. now how do we prepare or produce gum arabic uh, sorry uh, modified starch uh, so we can use uh, three methods here one is physical modification another one is chemical and the third one is genetic um, many 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 years ago 
the perhaps the most popular way uh, to modify starch is chemical modification. But again, because of the consumer demand, less and less now industry uh, use chemically modified starch. But some, some still use because there is no good replacement for, the, for that type of modified starch yet. But more and more industry are now try to use modified starch by physical modification. So physical modification considered not considered uh, because we don't use chemical, so considered still considered like a more or less safe or natural. Yeah. So that's why if you follow the research in starch on modified starch, especially, you'll find that a lot of research now focusing on de developing methods to modify starch by using physical modification. Physical modification means what? We don't use chemical. We use physical parameters like temperature, pressure. especially pressure and other ways. Yeah. The only type of starch modified by physical modification that, that has been uh, existed for a long time is pre-gelatinized starch. Yeah. Pre-gelatinized starch or sometimes also known as cook up starch. Yeah. Pre-gelatinized starch has been produced by using uh, um, drum drying methods by using a drum dryer. Okay. So the starch is dried on the drum, on the hot surface of the drum. Then uh, it will form a small uh, it will form a thin layer, then it will be scraped off. Have you learned about uh, spray uh, uh, drum drying in food processing? Ah, okay. So it makes sense, right? It will be scraped off, then after that grind and form a powder. So the starch is already cooked, gelatinized. That's why it's called pre-gelatinized starch. So this can, this can be used in those industries that don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, heating, uh, proper heating equipment. So they can add this pre-gelatinized starch uh, to the product, uh, then add water to the uh, product like baby infant food also use uh, pre-gelatinized starch. So the pre-gelatinized starch is perhaps the only starch that has been produced for a long time using physical modification. But more, more recently, more recently, recent, not so recent also, lah, yeah? um, the genetic modification. This is where the genetic engineering, the GMO, yeah? genetic modification uh, to produce modified starch. And um, in US, especially in Europe also, they have produced uh, corn or mass starch that has been engineered. Yeah? So this engineered starch is more resistant uh, towards uh, disease. Uh, and theoretically, everything can be engineered. <laughs> yeah, all, well, not all. A lot of things can be engineered. So, for example, potato, well, potato starch. Uh, naturally, there is no high amylose or waxy potato. Cassava, corn, yeah? um, wheat. Naturally, there is no waxy wheat, but now we have waxy wheat. So, these uh, people who are the, what they call, uh, those in the genetic, genetic uh, engineering uh, uh, area, they manage to modify uh, the starch to make it high, wax, high amylose or waxy starch. So this is uh, genetic engineering. If you want to read more, uh, this 1990 article, but uh, still very relevant and very good. Modified food starches, why, what, where, and how? Modified starches for the, this one uh, may be already old. Actually, you can find more recent one. Uh, review article, good article, comprehensive on modified starch. And there are a few online like uh, presentation given by the industry, which I think I have shared one in Enmodo. Please listen to those. Yeah? Um, you can find a lot of information there. Now, um, 
let's look at the chemical modification first in the industry now although less and less chemical chemically modified starch are being used but still some are uh, still um, being used because there's no replacement yet so we, we start with the native starch granule and one of the popular modification is called cross-linking so cross-linking basically we have the polymer chain here yeah, can be amylose can be amylopectin then we add new new covalent bond so it's not hydrogen bond it's a covalent bond so the cross-linking agent that we use these are the chemicals that we use that would form the new covalent bond that hold the polymer chain and sort of strengthen strengthen the granule I think this is quite easy to understand just like if we put it something like the net color and so on so when you add the new uh, point it will sort of provide strength so cross-linking the effect of cross-linking actually is to provide strength to the granule it will strengthen the granule uh, and the consequence of that is the granule the, the swelling of the granule would the tendency of the granule to swell would be lessened yeah and uh, when when the granule swell it will it will be able to retain the granular structure better and it is also now more resistant towards hydrolysis by enzyme or by acid because of this additional covalent bond is not readily hydrolyzed by the enzyme or by the acid the alpha 14 and alpha 16 are very prone very susceptible to acid or to enzyme but with that additional uh, covalent bond there the, the the ability of the starch to be hydrolyzed now also will become less so it become more resistant to low ph or high acid or even high ph alkaline condition it's all, it is now also become more resistant to shear so now we can use this starch under high shear condition we can use this starch under long time high temperature condition maybe in the retort so the law of advantage of cross linking but the amount of cross link the amount of cross uh, the amount of covalent bond added into the granule is actually very little we don't need much yeah we just put we just add this cross link to hold some point in the polymer network in the starch network and that is enough to strengthen and there is a reg there is a regulation also that limit the amount of cross linking cannot put too much yeah because of the safety issue i think another popular modification is called stabilization and the product of stabilization is called stabilized starch stabilization modification is uh, in contrast to cross linking cross linking we add new function new cross new covalent bond but in stabilization we add new functional group or we uh, we, we add a, a bulky a bulky functional group yeah a bulky functional group that would that would hinder uh, it provides like a kind of steric hindrance also halangan yeah? for the polymer chain to come close uh, together to form a strong hydrogen uh, bond yeah because uh, you can imagine there is something in between there that would not allow the starch polymer to uh, to 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 form a dense uh, network and therefore the formation of the hydrogen bond also would be uh, limited okay and this type of starch is very good for um, frozen food if you want to 
slow down the retrogradation especially for frozen food we, are, we, we always worry or concerned about retrogradation you don't want the cyanosis and so on so in this case we want to use stabilized starch yeah. um, stabilized starch is also good if if you want the, the starch to gelatinize at lower temperature yeah. if you want the starch to gelatinize at lower temperature Remember, when we add sugar, a lot of sugar in the starch, in the food containing the starch, the gelatinization of starch would be, the, the temperature, the gelatinization temperature of, of the starch would be shifted to higher temperature. So we need to cook longer or we need to increase the temperature. But if we don't want to do that, you don't want to change the processing time and temperature, then maybe you might, you might want to consider using stabilized starch in this case because the stabilized, the stabilized starch always would gel, start to gelatinize at lower temperature so when you have a lot of sugar there but you use stabilized starch you don't have to worry about the you know the changing the temperature or time because the starch can now start to gelatinize at lower temperature so that's another application of stabilized starch Another type of, um, uh, I think we'll be looking at each one uh, in the next few slides. Another type of modification is enzyme hydrolysis. Uh, this is very, very application of this enzyme hydrolysis modification is very, uh, very, very large, very popular. Why would we, why would we want to hydrolyze the starch? to produce product like maltodextrin yeah? maltodextrin or glucose syrup or corn syrup the, the general name for this is glucose syrup but um, in the literature maybe you find the term corn syrup because uh, historically the corn syrup is produced from a lot of corn syrup a lot of glucose syrup is produced from corn so that's that's why we also know uh, glucose syrup is also known as corn syrup so to produce corn syrup or maltodextrin we have to use enzyme to break down the starch into um, um, into uh, mixture of mixture of uh, oligosaccharide yeah mixture of oligosaccharide when we hydrolyze starch using enzyme depending on depending on how much we hydrolyze the starch we get two groups of products one is called maltodextrin another one is called glucose syrup sometimes also known as corn syrup the difference between maltodextrin and glucose syrup is the extent of hydrolysis. Well, then, when we measure the reducing value, the, 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 the reducing power of, of the hydrolyzed starch by using a common uh, analysis, you, you learn how to determine the reducing value, right? By using uh, then enone titration, by using uh, uh, DNS method then you measure the reducing power then we can express this as dextrose equivalent have you learned about this in the full analysis dextrose equivalent yeah? DE so short, the, the short of dextrose equivalent is DE This is actually a measure of reducing value divided by the weight of the solid, uh, solid substance that we, we use to measure. So in other words, it's a measure of reducing power of the product. So for maltodextrin, the DE is less than 20. For glucose syrup, DE is above 20. 
So it can range from 20 to maybe uh, commercially, uh, can find up to maybe uh, maybe 80, I think. For, for confectionery, usually they use glucose syrup around DE 60 or 62 for confectionery. When you read the application of starch in confectionery uh, in the in the well book, maybe you'll find there's more information about maltodextrin and glucose syrup. But they are the hydrolysis product of starch by using enzyme, and they are considered modified starch. Yeah, they are considered modified starch, but in this case, we use enzyme. In the old days, the cons the glucose syrup. Is produced was produced by mainly by using acid. By using acid, but by using acid, the process cannot be controlled easily. So you don't get consistent, you know, product from batch to batch. But enzyme is better because enzyme is more specific. The action of the enzyme is more specific, more control. So if we produce, say, glucose syrup DE62 under specific process condition and we repeat that we will always get the same DE value so that's the advantage of using enzyme please read more about maltodextrin and glucose syrup uh, because these are very important ingredients yeah. not, not necessarily because it will come out in the exam when I say please read more because <laughs> because I because otherwise until let, later you blame me oh why Prof. Karnan asked us to read more, but better you don't see the question in the exam. Yeah? The reason because these two, glucose syrup and maltodextrin, is now very, very widely used in the industry. So you should know more about this. Who knows, maybe later when you go out to work in the food industry, you'll come across this. Okay. Um, another, uh, a few more types of modification is oxidation. Yeah. Oxidation, to oxidize starch, we have to use oxidizing agent. And the most popular oxidizing agent is sodium hypochlorite. Do you know what is sodium hypochlorite? It's the active substance in Clorox. Clorox contain high, I can't remember, high percentage of sodium hypochlorite. It's a very strong oxidizing agent. That's why when you Clorox your clothes, it will bleach your clothes because it's a very strong oxidizing agent. So we use Clorox to modify starch. <laughs> <laughs> but in my research, we have developed a new method to modify starch, environment friendly. We use ozone. Ozone gas, ozone gas, yes? Yeah? And uh, we have published uh, two or three papers on that. Ozone gas, we just, exp ozone is very strong oxidizing agent. But when we expose the starch to ozone, ozone will break down into oxygen, finally. And it just, uh, we, uh, we just uh, actually um, expose the dry powder, the dry starch to ozone. Of course, we have to play around with the moisture, we have to play around with the time, contact time and so on and we found that it can actually oxidize the, st oxidize the starch to a level similar to uh, oxidation of starch by using sodium hypochlorite yeah? but theoretically we can use any strong oxidizing agent to oxidize starch but the effect of oxidizing starch is actually is also to break down the starch the starch will break down will be polym depolymerized so the effect of when you break down the starch, like en en enzyme hydrolysis and also oxidation, the effect actually will reduce the viscosity of the starch. So oxidation of starch actually is to produce a group of modified starch called low viscosity starch. Yeah? Oxidation as well as enzyme hydrolysis and acid hydrolysis as well. And dextrinization as well is a, a process, a modification process to produce a group of modified starch called low viscosity starch. 
please read more about low viscosity starch and the application of this. And this is a lipophilic. We add the lipophilic group to make the starch hydrophobic so that it has an emulsifying property. So I guess we have to stop now. So I'll be seeing you in three weeks' time, I think. Right? I'll be away for two weeks, then come back. We have mid semester break. Then uh, when we come back, we will have a test.